in your brain, you're in the nerds domain. Come on in, it's about to begin. Welcome to the Nerds Domain Podcast. In these episodes, we discuss a movie from the Criterion Collection. What is the Criterion Collection? The Criterion Collection is a continuing series of important classic and contemporary films on home video. Four average nerds watch a classic movie and discuss what they like and don't like. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Criterion Collection for Rashomon. I'm Matt. I'm John. I'm Jesse. I'm Shirley. And today we're going to talk about the 1950 movie uh, Rashomon from Akira Kurosawa, starring our favorite guy of all time, uh, Typhoon What's His Face. That's great. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that, that one guy from that one show. Toshiro Mifun? Toshiro Mifun. See, I said Mifun. No, you said Typhoon, but. Oh, uh, whatever. Teaspoon? Teaspoon, yeah. Uh, so this is his, like, fourth, third or fourth movie for us? Fourth. Yeah. So, um, all right, well, uh, Jesse, why don't you give us a rundown of the plot? Jesse? Wow, that was really good. Hello? Jesse? Oh, I'm back. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Where did you go? I didn't go anywhere. You guys just faded. Hey, Jesse, yeah. why don't you give us a rundown of the plot? Who, what? No, 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 not me. I might have fell asleep during some, some of it. Really? Because I was sitting there and somebody else fell asleep, too. Just the once. <laughs> it I, wasn't really sleeping. I closed my eyes and I breathed a little heavy and it might have sounded like a snore. It wasn't really sleeping. In all fairness, yeah. it does repeat the same story over and over. Yeah. Okay, so so who's going to tell the, the plot? I can do it. Okay. All right, because I only fell asleep because it was 3 a.m. and it was the last 10 minutes. Um, so the story of Rashomon is, oh, we open up with a woodcutter and a priest and a traveler taking refuge from the rain and the woodcutter and the priest talk about how they, um, can't understand what happened while they were in court that earlier that day, the traveler asks for the story and the woodcutter tell the woodcutter and the priest uh, begin to tell about how the woodcutter found a samurai's body in the woods. He had been murdered. Um, he went and told the police, and a bandit was captured and charged with the crime. And uh, the, the testimony of the bandit, uh, the samurai's wife, and the samurai's ghost all contradicted each other, and the priest and the woodcutter could not understand why that would have, why they would have told such des- such different stories. Um, the bandit tells us tells that he uh, tricked the samurai into uh, following or following him up a mountain path uh, where he tied him up so that he could have, have the wife um, in the biblical know get to know the wife in a biblical sense. Um, and then, uh, once that was done, the samurai and the bandit fought an honorable duel, uh, for the wife, for the wife's honor. Uh, the band and the bandit said he, he didn't want to kill him, but they, you know, honor demanded it. So they, they fought and the bandit won and they, you know, he killed the samurai. Then the wife comes in and tells a story about how, um, all that happened, except that the bandit left them uh, in the woods together and the samurai looked upon her with hate, pity, hate, and, and, and disdain all at once. She passed out while holding a dagger and woke up with her husband dead. And then a priestess comes in and channels the dead samurai's ghost. And, um, he tells his version of the story about how his wife wanted, uh, told the bandit to kill him. Um, and that, um, that didn't happen, but that the samurai ended up committing suicide because his wife had left him for the bandit. Uh, then, uh, we go back to the, um, narrators of the story, the priest and the 
woodcutter and the and the traveler and the traveler says i can see the flaw in that story i know that that you mr woodcutter are lying um about what exactly what happened so then the woodcutter confesses that he saw the entire event take place and that there was no um honorable there were no honorable actions by anybody and it was just a big mess and uh at the end of the story, the traveler uh, talks about the dagger that the the woman had throughout that went missing, and uh, the woodcutter confesses to killing, or to, sorry, not to killing, but to taking the dagger um, to sell. Then the uh, woodcutter and the priest find a, a an abandoned child in the place they were stay, staying out of the rain in, and uh, the woodcutter offers to take the child home and that somehow restores the faith in humanity and they wander off into the sunset. Okay. Sound about right? Yeah, essentially. Yep. So, um, what did you guys think of the acting? I like the acting, actually. That's one of the few things of the story I actually liked. Yeah, the characters were pretty well portrayed. There was, um, I mean, it was pretty typical for the time period of stage acting, kind of, uh, you know, still being the way everything was done. Um, So it was all overdone and and exaggerated to extremes. But, um, you know, it it was pretty, pretty... uh, standard for what we've seen out of this time period uh, yeah. in these, Jap- these these samurai films. Yeah, so, and each each narration had the characters portrayed a little differently, but you could still tell they were the same characters. Right. Uh, they were... when the During the bandit story, he was brave, bold, and, you know, a stand-up guy in his own opinion. And then during everyone else's story... He was a craven and a and a lecher, and you know, so it was interesting to see the same the same character acted by the same actor very differently. You know, um, reminded you guys. Me, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Reminded me of um, Jet Li's film Hero. That's it. That's the name of the movie. Thank you. I couldn't remember it for the life of me. Oh, yeah, I didn't like that one either. Oh well, I did. Is it Hero or the One? No, the hero. Oh, it might be the... No, no, it was hero. Yeah, the one is where he keeps killing alternate realities of himself to make himself stronger. The one was a great movie. Hero is about the the unification of China. um, Oh, okay. Where he tells the story... Yeah, he tells the same version of the story two or three times and then chooses not to assassinate the the first emperor of China. So you guys didn't think the woman was overacting quite a bit? No, not unless that guy was overreacting. Oh, okay, I can see that. Like I said, I think it was the stage, you know, stage performance where you had to project and exaggerate mm. to make sure the people at the back of the <clears throat> excuse me, there, the back, were, back of the hall saw you. Maybe. There, there were some things in the, the fight scenes that seemed a little off. I mean, even in the uh, the bandit's own point of view, he seemed kind of buffoonish and over swinging. Exaggerated. Yeah. yeah. And then during the last one, it was like, they were just swinging wildly. (laughs) Well, it, it was funny the way the, the fight changed, um, between each story, like in, um, the main character or the, the bandits, storytelling he you know had really good fighting skills and that's the way his story went and the further away it got from his story per each person the worse the fighting skills got between the bandit and the samurai and then finally when um the i don't know who the guy was the woodcutter who was the guy that left with the baby the woodcutter, woodcutter. The woodcutter. Finally, when it got to the woodcutter, like it was like neither one of them knew how to yeah. fight. You know. Well, I so yeah, and that's that's um, I mean that's part of the 
the point of, of the film, like everybody had their own version of the story. Right. We we have to assume the woodcutter told the truth, and you know the um, the bandit and the samurai wanted to portray themselves at. Well, did they even fight during the samurai's version? I don't even think they actually fought. I don't fought. think they fought. No. Yeah, but no. Yeah, so when the bandit was telling it, he and he and the samurai were the best, you know, swordsmen ever. But yeah, in the woodcutter's version, the the quote unquote reality of it is they neither one of them really had their heart in that fight. The the samurai no longer wanted his wife, and the bandit didn't want a wife, so they were just sort of desperate and you know clawing at each other, and and you know. Neither and one it was of more of a, yeah, it, was, it seemed like it was, okay, we have to do this for a sense of honor type thing, but, a sense of duty. But neither one of us really wants to be here, so we're not. Right. We're both, you know, desperate and, you know, not trying very hard, and neither one of us, neither one of the characters was really battle-hardened. You know, there was, I don't know exactly what era this is supposed to be in, but there's an era of Japanese history where samurai, or at least in in remembrance are view were viewed as uh pompous and you know not really worthy of the the title but it was an inherited title so they you know they acted the part they, they like yeah, they, strut they strut their stuff and i i pointed that out to matt like they said you know a couple times or the woodcutter said that you know he found a samurai's hat or something and i was like okay this guy isn't even making the presentation of himself as a samurai. It just yeah. seemed like he was just moseying along and it just didn't seem very samurai-ish. Right. So, I, I have a question. Each, yeah. each narrative had their own agenda. What was the lady's agenda in trying to state that she was the one who killed her own husband? Why uh, would she try to pin that on someone else? Um, but if it was honor, why would she, she was, do it as a, when she blacked out? Instead of something she did willingly. I don't know that she in, inferred that she killed him. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a way you could read it. But, I mean, didn't she infer that she woke up and he was dead and she didn't know how? She yes. had the dagger in her hand. She passed out. And when she woke up, the dagger was in his chest. Right. Um, because she wanted to be innocent of the the murder. Right. She Yeah, she never claimed that she had done the the murder she passed out before he died right so i was taking it as the whole like the werewolf thing you pass out and you you've done something but you kill somebody yeah, and like then you wake back up she was admitting and... to have done it she didn't admit to have not done it of her own free will mm, no and i think that's what um you know all of the men were saying were like okay this woman is crazy and you know they cry and they get their way and, you know, that's what her part of the story was. Like, she was like, oh, I fainted, so I didn't see who killed him with my dagger that was in my hand when I fainted. So what did you guys think of the 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 bandit's romanticized version of what happened? It seemed like the most action-packed, or at least, uh, uh, what do you call that, where you can do something not qualified that other thing words are words are good <laughs> words are good yeah I have no idea it's well, where you can do something but you don't bravado he, he, yeah his was not like bravado, his but... was like the the most like realistic or or, or in his mind the, like the most romanticized version of this skill he had he obviously didn't have if we're to believe the woodcutter well, what's his what's the point there even even romanticized the samurai's ability. Well, by, by honoring, yeah, by honoring your enemy, you're honoring yourself. I mean, the, the better a person you kill, the better you are. Yeah, he was a bolster right. his own yeah. reputation. Okay, but I'm not sure. So I'm I not guess. Sure the, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I'm not sure the woodcutter's narrative was the true one. Really? Yeah, I'm not sure which one was. It was all kind of left up to the air because, like I said, they all had their own agenda. The woodcutter was trying to right. conceal the fact that he had the knife. Even though he admitted it there at the end, I think he was trying to out the guy who was... The the, the one guy, the, the traveler, had stolen the kimono that was wrapped around the baby. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to state that he was better than him. Yeah. When the guy with the kimono um, outed him for having he... stolen the dagger. 
Yeah. I'm going to have to differ with you. He wasn't trying to state that he was better. He was asking him why he was doing such an evil thing. True. And some of it, I believe, was, you know, after you find out, oh, well, the guy accuses him of him stealing the, the dagger, but he never admits to it. Um, I mean, but he kind of stands there sullenly. So you're like, oh, okay, maybe he did. He admitted he had like And six it's too. like, yeah, his guilt what you know and the disbelief that men could be so evil and that's why he attacked it plus he had six kids himself so why is this man you know doing this to this poor little baby that can't defend himself yeah. I, I don't know and I just... so when i found when the story you know revealed that he had six kids duh i would steal the dagger too hello i've got six kids to feed yeah I mean, there is you know, that point. It's a I dishonorable say. thing, but every the samurai is dead. The woman has fled. The the bandit has fled. There's no one to take ownership over this thing that has been left in the forest. So how is it dishonorable that he took well, it? Well, it also comes cool. to see whose narrative was more correct, though. If he actually took the knife out of the samurai's chest, where she found right. it, that changes well, but things he completely. Said, he did say, but he said that. That she, he was murdered by a, a sword. He did, but is he just trying to get his own agenda across? Because of what the dead guy's ghost said. Yeah. A, somebody took a dagger out of my chest. And also, the woman said something about the dagger, too. So there there were two two calls for the dagger and two calls for the sword killing the man. Right. Right. And, and I mean, at this time of, the, of you know, science was not... Uh, forensic science wasn't really a thing, so... You know, Nobody and, and knows. the blades weren't such a big difference in size either. No. Right. So. Yeah. So. I don't know. Let's. I just assumed that the woodcutter was telling the truth. Well, so, um, I kind of sided with the uh, the dead guy. <laughs> you you would think because the ghost would tell the, the story correctly, wouldn't you? Like, or you know, at it's, least it's, with the right twists. I mean, I could see him exaggerating it to make himself better, but he would yeah. still have the same yeah. method of death. Right. But think of think of a ghost. You're no longer corporeal, so you have no um, what is it? you have no ego at this point in time. So why would he lie about you know something that has to do with a corporeal body? Why would he try to bol bolster his ego when being dead you do not have an ego? But we don't know the logics of the magic of the world the director created. Yeah, that's right. This is well, mm -hmm. and it's and it's also a different culture yeah. where I'm not sure what the rules for ghosts are. Yeah. Right. Shinto <laughs> Shinto mysticism is not something I'm up to up to date on, but uh well, you guys need to be educated, right? right. right. What? Well, yeah. Actually, I did some re I'm doing some did some reading on um Wikipedia and um during the filming of the movie, the actors of the of the story didn't know what the um, actual um, truth was. They didn't. They want. Oh, they actually kept going to Kurosawa and saying, "So, which one of which story is true?" <laughs> and he intentionally left it ambiguous. It's up to. It's it's funny that you say, Jesse, yeah. that you're not even sure you trust the woodcutter, um, because Kurosawa intended it to be ambiguous. I think that's that's what the moral of the the movie is. He's pointing out that every person in the world, no matter what they're watching, if they're all watching the same event, will always have a different take on what happened. And I think there are nuggets of truth there, too. I think the whole story is there. I just think they're in parts across four different stories. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So that and that that is why the movie gets the recognition that it does. That it, uh, well, and it's also the first time that this kind of uh, tell a story from four different points has ever been used. Was this yeah, right? right. Uh, was, okay, was so I would think that would be. A, I know it's not the fighting that made it a. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, it wasn't. I don't, I don't know. The, the, <laughs> the two, the, the first, the first fighting match, the choreogra choreography there was pretty good for 1950. Yeah. It was pretty yeah. good, sure. And Kurosawa's first film, so you know it's, it was all. It is. It was pretty good. Yes. But Did you notice how big the cast was? Uh, uh, Literally four, eight, seven. Like, I, yeah, I noticed the number of scenes it had. Different. There are yeah. there are eight people that were in the movie. The four. Uh, oh yeah. The so the the uh, 
The three people in the story. The three people in the story, the three people in the uh, shrine, the woodcutter, the traveler, and the priest, and then the cop who captures the bandit. And then the medium. And the medium, yeah. Yep. Yep. And it, well, technically nine, there was a baby. It was a real baby. <laughs> oh, okay, sure. that's true. Yeah. I guess that, that does make it nine. Yeah. The baby makes it nine. Didn't have lines, but... <laughs> There was only three locations in the film, wasn't there? So um, there was a very restricted number. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there were. I think there were only like three, maybe four. There might have been a fourth. Depends on how you split up that mountain path, because they yeah. they see you see the road a few yeah. times, and then they go up the hill where the actual murder takes place. And that was all that that whole mountain scene was shot outside for sure. Right. You could tell what from because there was a couple of clips where. They were showing the same scene, but like they clipped, they shot between clips, and the the branches had moved. Yep. And had it not been for that, you probably wouldn't have noticed. But I mean, this was nineteen, this was nineteen fifty, and it was a character of Sawa's like first movie. Yeah. That stuff's gonna happen. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah. But and you you know, there's no way you could build that set indoors and you know yeah. keep it you know to where you want to shoot in it all the time. So yeah. So yeah. It's, um. um so, oh, I just lost the question, Kirk. So, when did Hitchcock start filming? That's the question you could ask. The reason why I ask is because the scene with the woman and her face and how long it was, it just was very Hitchcockish to me. Um, I think that's just the style of the 50s. Uh, it looks like he was active from 1921 through 1976. Wow. Okay. So, um, so did you guys notice anything else uh, important about the movie? It didn't suck as bad as, uh, Dillinger's Dead? Nothing sucks as yeah, bad as Dillinger's Dead. That's pretty There's not a bad. single thing that sucks as much as that did suck. So, so far, that's, I mean. <laughs> Getting kicked in the junk doesn't suck that much. Yeah, that, that pain's over quickly, at least. <laughs> Let's try that. You ready? No, no. <laughs> um, so, um, so there was a lot of influence here from some of the silent films that had come before it. Um, just the way that the sets were set up. Um, there was a lot of talking, but there was a lot more... I think there was a lot more visual acting than audio. If that makes sense. Yeah, I, and yeah. I like the amount Kurosawa, of... Oh, go ahead. I like the amount of talking in this film. I gotta admit, I, I was, I was impressed with it. It's rather worth. Well, and that. and Kurosawa was a huge fan of the silent film. Yeah, and so he simplified a lot. I mean, the three sets, the eight people, nine if you count the baby. I mean, those are the kinds of things that really simplified the movie, which probably caught it, cut its cost way the hell down. Sure. Um, and did you notice the symbolic use of light? No. When the movie starts, it, oh, everything's kind of dark. And then as the woodcutter is walking away with the baby, he's, like, in a shaft of sunlight yeah. the whole way. Yeah, he's in a shaft of sunlight. But, like, there's, quote-unquote, dappled light throughout the whole movie on different things. And at one scene, they're, like, focusing on that dagger. And the dagger is gleaming. But it's in the shadow of this bush or something. So where is that light coming from? Yep. It's, like okay, this is what I want you to focus on. Or, you know, there's some significance here. So, and um, there's one time when the woman, maybe she's down by the brook or something, yeah. and she's illuminated in a certain way. Or when her, first is, her face is first seen out from under the... Right. Yeah. Because other than that, it's kind of shadowy. Yeah. Um, so did you guys notice any of that? I saw it, but it wasn't registering like a... I mean, it was... I was into the film, so you know it wasn't registering as a a deliberate thing. I was I was seeing it on a on an emotional level, you know, watching the film. So absolutely, yeah, it was I good. Caught, yeah, I, I caught the last one. Yeah, but that was yeah, the that one was I a really big one. Noticed. Yeah. Um. So, what else do you guys think about the movie? Any any other like anything else that stands out? I like the music. Did you? Yeah. I okay. did. I like the way that um, it didn't seem so overwhelming as some of the other films that we've seen. It was more mood-driven and kind of in the background. and, and Right, and okay. it seemed to enhance 
the scenes instead of overwhelm them. Okay. Yeah, it was very well used, the music in this one. I have to agree. Uh, Jesse, anything that still stood out for you? I like the characters. I mean, it's some of the actors, like you mentioned before, have been with us in quite a few movies, and I just like seeing them again. Uh, Johnny, anything stay out? Oh, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Shirley. What? I was going to make some snarky comments. Oh, well, so Johnny, anything that stands out for you? <laughs> uh, yeah, not not a whole lot. Like I said, I you know, I I like the movie. I preferred uh, Seven Samurai, but oh yeah, you know, oh this yeah. Was, this was not a bad movie, it, you know, by any means. Um, so I enjoyed it, but nothing really stood out. It was just a overall enjoyable thing to watch. So let's try something completely new. Okay. Not really. We've kind of done this before, but not directly. What did this movie influence? What do you think? Can you think of any movies that came that that grabbed something from this that made them made them stick out? The only one I can think of, and I thought this the whole time I was watching, it was Clue. Clue? Sure. Oh. Yeah. The with the three different endings. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because because oh. of the way they the release clue was each movie had an ending and that was the only ending you saw. Right. So if I went and saw it in Indianapolis, I might see one ending. If I went and saw it in Cincinnati, I'd see a different ending. Wow. So there were three endings that no one really knew the actual. When did that movie come out? Eighty two, eighty four. Yeah, yeah. We had to just recently wait until Netflix and Redbox came around so well, you could I, see the whole thing. Well, no, they came out on the DVDs. On cable, oh. Yeah, I've been watching yeah. on cable for years uh, with all. All the endings, but um, yeah, that I mean that I'm sure that's a part of it. Um, I mean, we already mentioned uh, Hero. Uh, yeah, that, that, that was that, that is was an one obvious. That me. Yeah, that is an obvious um, take on this on the on the Rashomon effect, as it's called according to Wikipedia. Uh, okay. So that that's what that is. Um, any time. Um, I guess there's there's a remake of this, a Western remake yeah, from 60, 1964 like called The Outrage. I'm intrigued. Yeah, it's, uh, it's got it's Paul, got Paul Newman. Newman. I mean, got, and William, William Shatner. Shatner. What? William Shatner. What? William Shatner. Uh-huh. I want to see this movie. Now. Yeah, I, I know, right? <laughs> that sounds like an amazing movie. William Shatner did Westerns? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What? 1964, that's like, that probably was filmed right before Star Trek started. Yeah. So he wasn't a name. Yeah, I'm, like he wasn't a household name. I just want to see what he's like. Well, he's going to be super, super young. I mean, for some <laughs> well, reason, the I mean, only Shatner I see like, in my mind is the old Shatner. Um, he was re- he was pretty young when Star Trek started. Well, I'm saying like like the Wrath of Khan Shatner. That's the that's my baseline Shatner. He's not old enough. He's he's, he's well, according to Jesse, he's ancient. But yes, he is a little middle age. He's not that young Jesse's spry guy that he is in the original series. That no. He probably hasn't used in a long time. So hey, be be nice to Jesse. Um So what did you guys think overall of the film? Let's go ahead and give it a rating. We'll start with Jesse, since he's gonna be the negative one. I am. I'm gonna <laughs> give it about two and a half. As oh, as, as John said earlier, it was a film. I mean, it was it was all right. It wasn't great. It wasn't stellar. It wasn't bad. It, it's a, it's a movie. I'm glad I okay. watched it, but it's definitely not the best Kurosawa film I've seen. Okay. If it had Kurosawa, that guy. If it had gone <laughs> faster, do you think? If it hadn't been filmed in 1950s techniques, no. do you think you would have liked it more? I don't like unreliable narrative as a story point. I really don't. I, I didn't like the Jet Li one. I don't like it in books. You can't trust anything from that point on. The entire <laughs> thing's a lie. I just, I don't know who to like. I don't, nope, nope, not my kind of story. Okay. No, that's fair. That's fair. Um, yeah. Shirley, what do you think? Poor Jesse's kind of nightmare. <laughs> so, okay, I'll come back to Shirley when she's done giggling. No, I'm fine. Okay, so what do you think? Um, I would definitely give it, uh, I w- as I was watching it and reading the, um, Stuff that comes up on the screen in English. Subtitles? Yeah, those. Yeah. <laughs> Words are good. Oh my god. <laughs> it's not even that late, guys. Gosh. <laughs> Holy cow. Anyway, whoo. So, mm, subtitles, those. Okay, as I was sitting there reading the subtitles throughout the movie, I was like, you know, this isn't that bad of a movie that I wouldn't put it on my shelf. So, I think a three, three point five. Okay. Because yeah, I mean, it's something that if 
you know, I forgot and I wasn't really doing something on a weekend and I forgot about part of the um, story, I'd be like, hey, that Kurosawa, so the guy with the stuff that Jesse said. Akira Kurosawa? <laughs> yes, that guy. Um, uh, yeah, I would pop it in the DVD and watch it as I was cleaning the front room or something. Okay. Uh, Johnny? Um, so, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I don't think that two and a half is uh, necessarily bad. I, I don't want to put a negative spin on it like Jesse's seem to be, but two and a half... <laughs> Two and a half average. An average it's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's definitely worth watching, especially if you have any interest in film history. Uh, you could see okay. one of the, I guess, one of the, the starts of, of a lot of traditions in film and, you know, a great influential movie uh, or a movie that influenced a lot of people. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not action packed. It's not a, a great romance. Um, you know what else? Yeah, yeah. I just realized what other movie I was thinking of. Uh, uh, romance. Was uh, Usual Suspects with Kevin Spacey. Okay. That's a movie. I can see that. that well, they because they have the uh, they they bring a bunch of criminals in and they talk about um, Kaiser Sose and everybody has their own story of how events went down and and in the end. Is this the one where the little girl or kid got killed in the bush? No. Okay. Sorry. No, that's the one where they attack a boat and steal cargo. Drugs. Oh, drugs. Sure. No. <laughs> you haven't seen. Yeah. You don't know Usual Suspects. You should watch it sometime. I guess not. Maybe it was Unusual Suspects. Yeah, it, it totally doesn't lie to you. <laughs> it, it it doesn't. In the end, it tells you the truth. It's true. Whether you want to believe it or not. <laughs> um. Anyway, so yeah, the you know this movie is 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 average. It's got some historical significance so it's worth checking out but as far as like enjoyment goes i'd say two and a half which is a good solid average film okay i think i'm 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 uh, gonna agree with johnny i think there's some very important aspects here i think the the minimalistic um use of both uh sets and actors is really important i think the watching an actor do the same character in three different ways four different ways i guess is really important. Um, and I really think that um, talking while someone is trying to get me to read what's on the screen is very difficult. Um, what? I think that the the, the, the fact that, that there's something called the Rashomon effect that is used nowadays to, to show this as an example, I think that shows that there's an incredible importance here. If it had been filmed in 19... 19- 78 or newer and had that kind of speed of storytelling, I think I would have enjoyed it more though. Sure. Um, so I'm going to give it probably, I'm going to give it a three just to go a little bit about Jesse's two and a half. <laughs> I can't, I don't feel good about putting it down there with what Jesse said. So I, I don't think it's a bad movie. I just don't, I don't think it's a great movie. <laughs> really I'm not saying it's a bad movie either. Five point scale. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, I, I don't like that kind of story, but it's still a good story for that kind of story. I don't like <laughs> I don't like cake, but that's the best cake I didn't like ever. Excellent. <laughs> oh, my oh. <laughs> so that probably averages us out to like a two point six seven or something yeah. ridiculous. Um, overall, though, I, I I did enjoy it. I I liked it enough. I don't know if I put it on my my shelf. I don't know if I would want to have to go out and track this down. However, if I could track this down, I'd go over to Amazon. See how I stuck that that ad right in there? Yeah. Um, I, I would go over to Amazon, and you can actually get 25 of Akira Kurosawa's uh, Criterion Collection movies. How would set. you get to Amazon, though? Uh, well, you go to our website, and you click yeah. a link on the right-hand side. It's the first one at the top. Oh. And anything you order from there, a little bit comes back to us. And you can order the Akira Kurosawa Criterion Collection movie set. I think it's 25 movies. I think it's like $400. You, you Whoa. Said you said there's 25 movies. You've got 20 more of these things to sit there? We've only yes. seen two of them. Oh, I thought Jesse, we, you're seeing all of them. Seen at least five. All of them. We probably all won't see them. all of them. There's one called Samurai, and then the sequel is Samurai Two. The and there's one back. called. And the sequel to that is Samurai Three. And then there's one called Dillinger is Dead. No, he did not do that movie. Do not, <laughs> do not compare, even connect him in any way to that movie. 
<laughs> you shall not besmirch his name. Um, if you guys, so to go on with a, another ad here, if you guys are interested in going to any PopCon here in Indianapolis, um, it's the last weekend of May, I guess technically the first Sunday of June. It's May 30th through June 1st. Um, if you have any interest in going and you're looking for tickets, I, accept, I, I would love it if you guys would go over to our website and click the link on the right-hand side. It says, you want to go to Indie PopCon? Click here and buy tickets. You could also just go to Indie PopCon and click buy tickets and put in our code MQUI, um, and that will get you uh, nothing different except that it helps us a little bit. It gets us kind of some recognition um, with the Indie PopCon people and kind of helps us get some points to maybe get some extra stuff. We will have a um, booth. Bo- we'll have two booths. Oh, both really? Nerds Domain. Both Nerds Domain will have its own booth, and the uh, Omega Nerds Network will have its have a bo- booth of it as well. Hopefully, right next to each other. I think I worked that out. Um, we will also be hosting a panel on how to start a pod, uh, podcast, kind of on the cheap, because you know we have some <laughs> we have some uh, knowledge about that. So. You should check those out. And just as a reminder, Gen Con is coming up in August. If you don't live in Indianapolis, you should still come. I can't stress that one enough. And we will be running a very, very special, um, assuming that Gen Con doesn't reject it completely, a very special Call of Cthulhu game there with um, some interesting twists. Mm-hmm. And the author. And the authors. The author and, and a couple of his podcasting buddies will be here, hopefully, from England to help sit in and enjoy the game and bring a new feel to it. So uh, either one of those events would be great to see any of you guys at. If you happen to run into us, let us know that you listen to the podcast. We're always happy to hear from fans, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, if you have anything you want to tell us, you can always email us at nerdsdomain at gmail.com. We would love to hear all about that. If you want to make fun of Jesse because he doesn't <laughs> like Pacific Rim, or you want to make fun of Johnny because uh, he doesn't, he loves My Little Pony, or if you want to make fun of Shirley because... Because there's no reason to make fun of Shirley. This is true. She really liked um. Dillinger's dad. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to make fun of me, because I that can't think of any reason you would make fun of I'm me. I'm glad Matt was with me, because that really made me want to commit suicide. Oh. <laughs> or, if in the future you want to see our homemade film that will be a remake of Dillinger's Dead and should take around 15 minutes. Because <laughs> we're going to do it. I we're promise. We're doing it. Um, but I if you want to get a... Kickstarter. <gasps> Tell them about the Kickstarter. Uh, actually, the uh, Kickstarter, by the time this goes up, will be yeah, over. Everyone. We have funded, and we want to thank everyone, especially our Uncle Ed. Um, Uncle Ed is awesome, and we love Uncle Ed. Right, guys? Yes. Yay! <laughs> um, <laughs> we have funded. We've heard, hit our first stretch goal. So that panel that you heard on, uh, that you just heard about, we're going to record that and release that only to our Kickstarter backers. Um, hopefully we'll have, I'm almost guaranteeing, and that's probably the worst thing I can do, that we'll hit our second stretch goal, which is to get the second table. And then our third stretch goal is kind of still out there, but it will get us more swag, probably some buttons, and maybe a button press so we can press some more buttons. Buttons. Buttons um, are good. But we'll have shirts, and we will definitely have prints. I have those ready, and I'm getting ready to send those off to the printer to test out right now. Yep. And those are exciting, and, you know, there's going to be all kinds of stuff going on in any PopCon. And we'd love to see you there. If you if you have if you have missed the the Kickstarter, but you still want to help us out, we're gonna have a way for you to do that. Here come, I'd say middle of April, we'll have that finalized. Keep a look on our website. Keep an eye out on our website. Keep an ear out on our podcast. And um, I think we'll talk to you guys real soon. Two point eight seven five. That, that's, <laughs> that's our star rating on on this on this movie. <laughs>